Linear interpolation, or lerping as it's often called. What is it exactly, and what problem does it solve? Well, think of it like this. Imagine two points, labelled A and B, that are connected together by a line segment. Linear interpolation will allow us to find any point that sits on this line as a percentage between A and B. The percentage value that we supply is a float spanning from 0 to 1, so you can imagine the full length of this line as being mapped into a 0 to 1 range, where 0 would correspond with the starting point, and 1 would correspond with the end point, and so a value of 0.5 would result in a point that sits halfway between the start and end points. Assuming we're working in two dimensions, where each of these points have an x and y position, this already gives us a good indication that lerping is something that we can apply to 2D vectors, and in fact this is true. The Unity API implements 2D lerping via a function called vector2.lerp. It outputs a 2D coordinate, which is the result of the lerp. In our example, this would be the xy position of the point, somewhere on the line AB. The function also includes three input parameters, called A, B, and T. The first two parameters, A and B, represent the start and end points. In our example, this would be the points A and B respectively. And then T is where we pass in the percentage value. Taking it one dimension higher, Unity also offers a lerp function for 3D points called vector3.lerp. And as we can see, the parameters are pretty much identical. It's just that the lerp is being resolved in three dimensions instead of two. And looking at this visually, we can quickly check that this does indeed work, since we are still able to connect two points with a line in 3D space. All 3D points that lay on this line are then addressable with the percentage value, much like the 2D example. And if you'd like to have a go at this yourself, it's extremely simple. In Unity, we'll create a new script called lerp, open this up. Inside the lerp class, we will declare two fields called A and B that will store the transform of the start and end points, and a float field called T that represents the percentage. Then in the update method, we make the call to vector3.lerp, passing in a.position for the start point, b.position for the end point, and finally t as the percentage value. Since this function returns a vector3, which is the point somewhere between a and b, let's assign this value to transform.position. This way, whatever object this script is attached to, it will have its position set to the result of the lerp. Then we'll set up the start and end points in the scene as cube meshes. And we'll add a sphere, which will represent the point between them. Attach the lerp script to the sphere. Drag the start and end point cubes into the A and B slots of the lerp script. When you enter play mode, you'll find that by adjusting the value of T on the lerp script, it allows you to move the sphere between the start and end points. Note that if we were to move either of the end points, the position of the sphere updates instantly so that it's always in the correct position between the two points. This occurs since we're not only updating the percentage value every frame, but the position of the start and end points as well. Looking at this in our 2D example, we can see this more clearly by moving points A and B around the screen. The point between A and B will always remain in the correct position between them. Notice that in the 3D demo, I didn't use any sort of range slider for the variable t, so the value is free to travel outside the 0 to 1 range. However, even if t does go outside this range, you may have noticed that the sphere is never able to travel any further than its start and end points. This happens because when we pass t into vector3.lerp, the function will take its local copy of this value and then clamp it between 0 and 1 before it's used in any calculations. If this isn't what you wanted, and you'd like to be able to address the area beyond the start and end points, 
Unity offers a variation of the lerp function called lerp unclamped, which is available for both 2D and 3D vectors. This takes identical arguments, but in this case, t isn't clamped inside the function before it's used. To achieve this in our 3D demo, we can simply call lerp unclamped instead of lerp, and the sphere is now free to move beyond its start and end points in either direction. In Unity, we can also lerp between colors. You have a start and end color, and then the percentage value as usual. So it's pretty much the same as the other variations we've seen so far. So we will want to set up a script called lerp color. In the class, we will expose two fields in the inspector, A and B, that represent the start and end colors. And we'll also have an extra color field, which we will use to quickly display the output color of this lerp. Then we'll add a float for the percentage. Then in update, we'll want to set the output color to the result of our lerp, and we'll then pass in A, B, and T respectively. And as expected, in play mode, if we set A to black and B to white, and then change the percentage, we get as output different shades of grey, which is maybe what you'd expect. But it seems a bit unintuitive to think about. So far we've been working with LERP in a spatial sense, in terms of the distance between two points. So how can this be applied to a colour, exactly? Well, Think of it like this. In two dimensions, a point is represented as a two-component vector, x and y. In three dimensions, a point would be a three-component vector, x, y, and z. The question is, though, if a color in Unity behaves like a four-component vector with an R, G, B, and A component, what's stopping us from treating this as a spatial position as well? The only difference is that it represents a point in four-dimensional space. Of course, we can't imagine what 4D space looks like, so for now, let's pretend that the alpha component of the color doesn't exist, so we're left with three components, R, G, and B. By assigning each of these color channels to the X, Y, and Z axes of a 3D coordinate space, we can visualize the entire range of available colors as a cube, where all points that sit inside this cube represent a particular color. We can see that the color black sits at the position 000, or the origin of our 3D space, and on the far diagonal of the cube sits 111, or the color white. So by lerping between black and white, like we did in our earlier example, what we're actually doing is finding a color along the line that connects these two points together in this 3D representation. Here we can see that the line runs through all of the different shades of grey along the diagonal of the cube. So suddenly this makes a lot of sense. By interpreting colors in 3D space, we can see that lerping a color is no different to lerping a vector. I like to think of a color as a vector in disguise. So at this point, you should have a fairly good idea of what a lerp does. But how is it calculated under the hood? To answer this question, we're going to talk about the simplest form of lerp in Unity, that being mathf.lerp. Compared to vector2 and vector3.lerp, this is essentially the one-dimensional variation of that. In other words, it lerps between normal float numbers. In the Unity CS reference GitHub repository, if we navigate to the mathf source file, we can locate the implementation of mathf.lerp. As we can see, it returns the expression a plus b subtract a multiplied by t clamped between 0 and 1. For the sake of simplicity, let's pretend that t isn't clamped, and we can then pull this out onto the screen as a fairly simple expression. As I mentioned earlier, mathf.lerp is a one-dimensional lerp, so we can visualize this as a number line. Let's arbitrarily choose 2 and 6 as the start and end values, and let's say that we supply a percentage of 0.5. We know the result of the lerp will be 4, but let's step through how this works. 
we are first required to subtract 2 from 6. This will determine the distance between the start and end values. The result of this is of course 4, but I'll also represent this quantity as a red bar on the number line starting from 0. The next thing we need to do is multiply the 4 by 0 0.5, which is the percentage. This has the effect of scaling the value of 4 to half its size, so it would become 2. Finally, we add this result to the start value, which is 2. Visually speaking, this offsets the position of the bar so that it begins at the start value instead of 0. And since the starting value is 2, and the length of the bar is 2, this results in 2 plus 2, which is 4, the final result of the lerp. So maybe you have a better intuition for how lerping is calculated. Though, how does this relate to all of the other data types that we've explored throughout this video? Looking at the implementation of the vector2 lerp function, we find that it uses the same expression as mathf.lerp, but it does so for each of its dimensions. Remember that a and b in this case are vector2 coordinates, so the output vector's x value is simply a one-dimensional lerp between a and b's x values, while its y value is a one-dimensional lerp between a and b's y values. Both of these expressions share the same percentage value though, so it's clamped once on a separate line above, and then it's used repeatedly for each dimension of the vector. For a vector 3, we just add an additional expression for the z dimension, in which we lerp between a and b's z values. And of course, the color lerp is implemented exactly the same, though instead of the x, y, z, w convention, it uses r, g, b, and a instead. And that concludes today's video. I hope you found this useful. I've never tried this format before, so be sure to let me know if you'd like to see more animated content like this. Of course, this took me a while to put together, so if you like what you see, be sure to show your support by liking and subscribing. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you soon.